I'm Matt Goodhouse. I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I lead the uh, VLSI Design and Automation Lab. Um, I come from a little bit more of an ASIC design background, ASIC design and EDA for ASIC design. And I'm going to talk about OpenRAM. Uh, this is uh, open source memories for open source silicon. So uh, you notice in the logo, there's a little um, funny S. That's the people from around here No, That's the banana slug. That is actually our mascot of our university. We're very proud of it. Um, that's one I took a picture of on a run uh, nearby. Um, famous in the movie, Pulp Fiction. And I, did, I noticed when I put this in here, I have a handlebar mustache, so I'm Samuel L. Jackson. So, um, I didn't notice that until I put him there, and I'm like, okay, that works. Um, anyways, so um, first question is, I noticed a lot of people here are actually interested in FPGA stuff. Right? And I come from an ASIC background, so I kind of re-gauged my presentation towards who I thought might be interested. So one of the big questions is, when you do a design, what should we do it in? Um, an ASIC design, which is custom silicon, an FPGA, which you can have a piece of silicon that's pretty good and fast and so on, or a microcontroller. I did a sabbatical at UCSF, and I tried to convince everyone to go get, do as little hardware as possible, actually. So I've heard a lot of people talk about that. But we do need hardware, right? So each of these has a different niche in what it's good at. So um, if you look at just the cost of one of these, if you have a microcontroller, it's pretty cheap because they can be used for anything and they have high volume selling them. Um, if you make your own ASIC, if you have enough volume, they're actually really cheap. That's why people make their own chips. You know, Apple's making their own chips because they can make them cheaper. Um, FPGAs are actually somewhere in the middle of cost. They're actually fairly expensive for what they are, but you can still have dedicated hardware. Um, one of the other areas where they differentiate is the non-recurring engineering, non -recurring engineering costs. So the problem is ASICs are really hard to make. You can mess it up and it will be a piece of silicon that's a brick. You can't do anything with it. FPGAs and microcontrollers are great because they're very flexible. You can re, you know, reboot, reflash, fix things. So they're very forgiving in that way. Uh, the other thing is the, the design flow complexity. We keep talking about high level languages and, and stuff. And really down at the low level, if you think about it, microcontrollers are the easiest. You can just write GC, GCC code, compile it, and, and so on. FPGAs are somewhere in the middle. You can make a bit stream, upload it, and keep trying till it works. Uh, ASIC flows are very complicated. Um, you have a lot of steps to it, especially the more advanced of a technology node you get to, the more complicated it becomes. Um, so that's a barrier to actually doing custom chip design. Now, the advantage of custom chip design, in addition to being low cost, if you have a volume of, of chips, is performance. If you have custom silicon, it's always going to be faster and always going to be lower power. I can guarantee. Orders of magnitude. So that's why people make custom chips. FPGAs are a good kind of in the middle because you have custom hardware, but it's this inefficient reprogrammable lookup tables and so on. So they're not quite as good. Um, microcontrollers. They're, they're actually the worst because they're very inefficient. They're general purpose processors, and so they're not very efficient if you look at kind of application level. Think about how much parallelism you can do in hardware versus you have to do serial operations in, in um, a microcontroller, unless you have an advanced architecture like we saw in the last talk. So, and then there's also the flexibility, you know. An ASIC is you make it in silicon and it's done. We saw these um, game systems yesterday, they were reverse engineering, where they actually used to make ICs that just played one game, right? That's the ultimate in you know, uh, application-specific IC. And um, so the flexibility is incredibly low the more specific you get, whereas the more programmable you get, the more flexible it is. So the question is, you know, which one of these is best for your application? Now, what I'm going to really talk about is kind of the, um, the cost stuff and, and some of the flow complexity, which is, I hope to address with OpenRAM. So what about cost? Everyone thinks making your own chip is super expensive. Um, here's actually a plot from uh, SemiWiki of TSMC and how much money TSMC, the fab in Taiwan, makes from um, different tech technology generations for chips. And I kind of zoom in here more so you can see the plot. If you look here, you think of the most advanced technology node every time, 7 nanometer, you know, 10 nanometer. And you know, Intel's dumping a billion dollars into a fab for that technology. That's, that's not reachable by our community. We can't do that, right? But if you look at that, that's you know, like half of the chip volume that's out there. There's actually a third of chips made use the old technologies. The reason being is they're still pretty good. You can do a lot of stuff in an old chip technology 
and, and fit a lot of transistors and do a lot of stuff at higher performance than you could do in programmable um, devices. So that's really the kind of the target market where OpenRAM's trying to help out is try to do that for potentially the open source community. So then the question is, if I want to target these older technologies, how much can I do with that? How much can I do with that amount of silicon? Well, actually, first, the cost. So to actually to show what the cost is to make a chip. So this is just a bunch of random multi-project wafer uh, companies, Muse Semiconductor, CMP, and I show Mosis. This is all publicly available information on their websites. If you look through, you know, they have all these old technologies up there, 180 down to 28, which is not that old. That's still pretty advanced. And you can see they typically quote costs in per millimeter square of silicon. And you can see, you know, 180 nanometer at Muse starts at about 1,000 bucks up to 13,000. So it scales up rapidly. Um, CMP over here, it's similar prices in euros. Uh, if we look at um, XFAB, actually, I have here, it has some older technologies. 0.7 micron is about 300 bucks. That's not that bad. It's more expensive than a PC board. It's more expensive than an FPGA. But if you're going to ship a few thousand things, that's actually reasonable. And if you can get more power out of it, that's even more reasonable. So here's kind of a summary of those slides. You can look at, we see a couple things here. This is the cost per technology node for one millimeter of silicon area, along with the Moore's Law plot, essentially, of how many NAN2 gates do you get per millimeter. If you look down here in the end, 0.7 micron, you get about 4,000 gates, so about like an ICE-40 FPGA, and it, for 300 and some bucks to make that chip. And there's a little additional stuff for packaging and so on, but it's not that expensive. Um, and, you know, but for an ICE-40, it's seven bucks for 5,000 gates, but the power trade-off is gonna be huge. It's gonna be probably 100x faster and, and lower power. So this is, there's going to be some market for custom silicon. Now, the other reason that there is this market is for these older technologies, there's a lot of people do stuff with wireless and analog. Um, to do that stuff well, they typically do it in older technologies. So I see a lot of interest in OpenRAM from those types of people as well. Now, now that it's possible to make a chip, so even in kind of an open source way, you know, without a lot of money potentially, we want to do this with open source tools. And there's been a lot of movement towards making custom silicon with open source tools as well. Some of it overlaps with the FPGA community. If you look at a typical design flow, um, this is for an FPGA or an ASIC where you have some sort of a library. Um, in case of an ASIC, it's a technology library, your design rules. In an FPGA, that'd be like what type of uh, lookup table structure you have and any sort of BRAM and so on. You also have some sort of designs. This could include analog IP, memories, and custom-made components for an ASIC or the BRAM blocks for an FPGA. Now, the front end of this synthesis flow can start from Verilog or an RTL or a high-level language, and this synthesis stuff basically is all the same for FPGA and ASIC flow. The thing that changes is the back end. And you do place and route, and you do complicated rule checking, and you basically, instead of a bit stream in FPGA, you end up with a GDS file that you send to a manufacturing house, to a fab to make. And so the challenge with this really is um, standard cell libraries, I, when I was kind of in grad school, I won't say how long ago, but uh, standard cell libraries were the thing, but no one had one. It's like, how do I do synthesis without a standard cell library? I had to get it from a fab, but they won't give it to me, and so on. They're pretty available now. You can get them from quite a few places. The thing that's not available now is memories, because memories are actually fairly complicated to generate, and more importantly, they're complicated to verify and to test and to make good. So how do we make memories in a system like this? Froze. Okay, so how do you make memories then? Well, they're a custom flow that's kind of separate from this synthesis and place and route flow. Um, typically a memory compiler, I, I hate the word compiler because it can, software people hear it and they're like, what, what are you compiling? How are you compiling memory, right? But it stems from back in the day when you used to have silicon compilers before you had standard cell stuff. You'd actually compile into polygons directly. And that's what a memory compiler does. A memory compiler, RAM generator, they're all kind of the same concept. 
you basically have a set of design rules that you put in. This is usually kind of your metal spacing rules and top level um, stuff. You also have a set of custom cells, which will actually be your, your memory bit cell, potentially plus some other auxiliary stuff like uh, sense amplifiers and so on. And then you have a configuration script. And you can feed these all into a memory compiler, which basically, what's it doing again? And I'm waiting for it to go to the next slide, but. And it, this memory compiler produces a bunch of these um, IP deliverable views. And so we saw a couple presentations on basically how to potentially distribute those views, how to coordinate them in terms of packaging and modules and so on. And we have things as far as the physical layout, um, uh, left files, which are used in place and route tools, um, Verilog simulation models, um, SPICE models, and so on. And so here's the punchline. So the SRAM generator is the, um, the thing that makes the sausage. So it, uh, it, it basically does a bunch of mapping of high level stuff. It crunches down into polygons. And you may think of a memory as very simple. It's a regular structure. But the difficult part is actually the control logic. So how to do the timing and then the characterization of it. Those are the t complicated things. The polygons are actually not so bad. So why do I want to make an open source memory compiler then? Well, we've heard a lot about um, open source IP. There's a lot of stuff out there and it's really good. It's getting a lot of traction. The problem is that most of these depend on memories at some point. Um, if you target an FPGA, you're lucky to have block RAMs, BRAMs, and you want to map to those. If you're making an ASIC design, you need to map to something. And you need to usually get it from the fab to have something to make. And the problem is, these are bottlenecks for designs, typically. Memories are almost always the bottleneck. We heard the last presentation, you know, accessing um, memory can, can be problematic. So they're the bottleneck. You may think that they're easy because they're regular, but, and they are, but for all the other stuff, tool support can be reused and do all of the timing characterization and, and verification stuff that is shared among all memories. That's not technology specific. And so, that's where OpenRAM wants to kind of fill in the gaps is this infrastructure around memories to be able to make people more productive with memory design. And then finally, this is kind of my uh, greedy motivation. Cell libraries I mentioned have existed, but in PDKs and so on, but there's really no available memory solutions for uh, research, because I'm a researcher by trade. I should press the forward button about a minute before I want to go to the next slide, so. I think it's an older draft, but that should be fine. Yeah. Oh, so the contemporary compilers. So why do we not want a memory compiler then? Or why would we potentially not want a memory compiler? Actually, full screen. Where is full screen? There we go. OK. Well, the, the main issue is that the bit cells are proprietary and they have really problems when they scale down with lithography. Manufacturing them, them is complex and the, a lot of the people that make chips try to keep them secret. They don't want to give you the details because that gives away their secret recipe for the sausage that we saw. And so um, uh, they do extra stuff like wave DRC rules because they try out the bit cells and they make sure they work and they don't have to follow the typical rules. Another thing is you typically have to characterize things in silicon before you really get the performance and power numbers. And I mentioned before, a lot of the information you need to make memories is typically not easily accessible, so that's another thing. And then finally, you, a lot of companies will, that are not big companies that don't make their own memories will just buy memory IP from someone. So that's the other option is just buy it. And so I already talked about the compilers. So what I want to propose is there's all this stuff that's reusable. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's not do all this simulation infrastructure again. Let's make something that everyone can use. You can plug in your own technology specific stuff and you can go from there. So you can start with things I give you for the technology, replace them with the actual technology if you use a fab that has a secret recipe, and then you get ideas of what your performance will be early in the design cycle. And also then the open source community can explore how things would be if you made them in an ASIC design methodology. So. For me, I'm a researcher and I want to do circuits and memory research and things like that. I want to do early prototyping of architectures. I want to try new circuits. I need access to the internals of memories. 
Um, I want to avoid having NDAs because they'll tell me I can't publish with their secret memories. I want to quickly be able to try, say, a new memory cell. Um, we've seen new technologies like memristors and um, all these other devices. And we can try things like that just by swapping in a single cell. And the rest of the infrastructure doesn't change. Um, finally, I also want this, though, to be a gateway so that I can try those things out and then I can quickly prototype them and get silicon back with the proprietary rules and get results. There's a lot of memory research out there. If you look at these solid state circuits people that make like one memory or one bit cell and say, oh, mine's better. But they can't say that it works for, you know, three sizes of memories or a different port configuration. And they don't, they don't explore that because it's hard. You have one grad student that spends his entire PhD making one memory array, and that's all they do. So I want to quickly be able to go from these exploratory ideas down to real silicon designs. So what is OpenRAM? So that's how we get to OpenRAM. Um, OpenRAM is a Python program. It's BSD licensed. I give out two implementations. One is a 45 nanometer that you can't make. It's kind of estimated design rules, but it's complete. The other is uh, the MOSIS scalable rules, which you can make, but it's an older technology. It's a, roughly equivalent to the TSMC 0.35 micron. And it generates memories in either one of these technologies. And for basically any size memory, any configuration, and so on. Um, I, it goes through, it provides the timing and power characterization, and it does random functional simulation as well to do kind of uh, circuit checking and so on. And it generates all the models you need for um, you know, layout, spice, Verilog, and verification. Now, the way I do this is I also pr use both com open source tools, the open circuit design methodology with Magic and NetGen for um, the MOSIS uh, process, and I also support several commercial tools from commercial vendors. And this applies to both the DRC and LVS checking and also for SPICE simulation. And there's two modes for OpenRAM, uh, front-end design. This is intended to be fast for architects and people that might just want to give an, get an estimate of kind of how good a performance or area their design would be. It basically requires no setup. Um, you can get a mob, most of the models out and s synthesize using them and, and so on. Uh, and then there's a back-end mode, which actually does some complete analysis. It does power routing, simulation characterization, and if you actually want to manufacture it, you have to get the final layout models in that view. And we support both of those modes. By default, it's the front mode there because I've had a number of people that, if I do the other mode, they run it and it takes you know, half a day to do something for a small memory. They're like, what? It's broken. But it, memories are very slow to characterize. So, um, It's configured with a, basically a simple configuration file. This would be great to use one of these package managers, package managers uh, and kind of use a similar uh, description capability. You can configure the technology, size of the memory. Not only that, but also kind of the voltages and temperatures and process corners you want to make sure the memory works at. This is all stuff that's needed to do a reliable implementation. Um, you can configure which tools you use to do this, um, to generate the memory. And you can also substitute in custom parts um, dynamically. And that's one of the things I want to be able to do for some of my research experimentations. And I mentioned tool portability. We support the full open flow. Um, there was a tape out of the Pico, the 30, Pico RV32, um, known as Raven, by the, uh, Tim Edwards from Open Circuit Design. And basically, I support that entire methodology already. And I support a number of commercial tools for um, DRC and LVS for the rule checking. Um, one thing I really want is open source DRC and rule checking. Um, being able to do some of this stuff, even with estimated rules, is really important. But it's mostly magic supports it kind of for older technologies. But it would be used to have something useful to have something flexible for more modern technologies as well, even if it's approximate. Um, we use for Spice. That's actually fairly easy. We have a lot of really good open source circuit simulation stuff. We support NG Spice and a number of commercial tools. One thing with open source with memories is actually debug. We talk about digital debug being difficult. Analog design and debugging is actually even more hard. So this is something where we're starting to actually explore how to debug timing failures when you have configurations that may not work. And um, I think. Again, it's analog design and debugging analog models at the lowest level. So that's one challenge that we're seeing. And then it's also multi-threaded support is actually very important. NG Spice is actually ahead of some of the other simulators that it can do 
parallel model evaluation and, and simulation, and so it's quite fast. Um, in terms of technology, we try to keep it as general as possible. We have those two reference implementations, and we basically have a simple uh, configuration file with some of the design rules, and the way we approximate it is we try to come up with a conservative set of design rules so that for the things that are not the main memory array, you cannot make them as compact as possible. You can just make them okay, and since they're not a big chunk of the memory, they don't matter that much. The mo important thing is really the bit cell that's replicated, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 times. And that cell is typically custom designed by hand and, or from the vendor, and you can substitute that in. So you have a couple custom designed cells, such as the bit cell and the sense amp. Then everything else is basically um, fairly easily set up. Um, one of the big things is the power and delay characterization circuitry. So this is built on top of general SPICE simulators. It fi finds um, setup and hold times, uh, delays of the memory um, in various corners. So various temperatures and voltages. It also measures power in each of those, and it puts this in the lib file, which is read by Yosis and all those standard uh, synthesis tools. So that's all all available for use right now. Now, one of the things that we saw a lot of stuff earlier today on verification. That is one of the approaches I've taken with OpenRAM, and I think that's one of the most valuable parts of this infrastructure is. We started with a set of unit tests that build each component of the memory and do both DRC, LVS, and we don't do simulation of each subcomponent, but it does a lot of verification of those as you build up so you can diagnose where problems are in your design early. And this allows people to debug when they port to a new technology, or it also allows them to you know, change something in the memory and debug where it may integrate, not integrate well. And so every module we have has its own regression test. This lets us uh, keep track of these stats. And it's the most flexible thing I think we did with OpenRAM. We also do continuous integration where we run this barrage of tests in both technologies and produce the results. And we're adding some stuff to basically track um, power performance and area as well over time. So we can see how that changes as we, as we improve OpenRAM. So what do the layouts look like? So here's basically a small memory um, it's made to basically show, illustrate the peripheral circuitry. It's a two-port memory. You see the big array. You've got a decoder over here and a read-write port on the bottom. On the top here, you have a read-only port and the decoder of it corresponding on the right. And you can see there's a little room for some improvements, but um, it produces working memories. Um, we've taped out in one process technology so far, not one of the two I've shown, but a commercial, a separate proprietary one. And we're working on a couple more tape outs right now with a couple um, collaborations um, in, in Europe, actually. And you can see here's a larger memory where you can see that you know, this peripheral stuff that you make with estimated design rules is not as important as the memory array itself. And so that's why you can use these conservative design rules and just overestimate things. And it's not that bad in terms of area, penalty in area. Now, the important thing is here is if you can look at area of the memory uh, the number of bits on the x-axis and the area here, this bottom purple line is basically how OpenRAM scales. If you were just to just synthesize a memory with flip-flops, this is the top line. It scales horribly. And so that's why we need memories and designs. Otherwise, you're going to be do dominated by flip-flops for area. Even if you're smart and use latches, you would see this blue line right here. It quickly dominates your area. This right here is actually an experiment we did where we said, well, what if you don't use a hand-designed memory bit cell, but you actually synthesize one? So we generated the layout automatically using design rules. It's not as efficient as the hand-designed one, but it's still okay. And we also do that automatically in OpenRAM right now. So if you don't hand-design the bit cell, it'll use that one. So that's something else we've added. So um, that's OpenRAM. So it's all up on GitHub. Uh, you can download it. It's open source, flexible. Um, I think, Josh, you mentioned the other day, uh, register files, FIFOs, CAMs, all the infrastructure we've made has been made with the intention that we can also apply it to all those structures. I just need to find the people to do it. So if you want to collaborate on those, I have a lot of projects to do. So, yeah, open up for questions. So uh, on your configurations, do you support write-through configurations? So we're, we're technically, do we, the question is, do we support, I guess I don't have to say it because you said it. Uh, I'm used to places without a microphone. 
uh, we don't necessarily make caches. So we make just the SRAM arrays. So if you want to configure this into a cache, you can configure it as a write through or however you want. Um, for example, we're currently generating the memories actually for Boom, the RISC yeah. V. It outputs a list of what memories it wants for its cache yeah. and its you know, TLB yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so that at the Verilog level would implement the write through behavior. No. When I say write through, I mean, if you have a read write port and you're reading, oh. and if, you have, or if you're reading and writing yes. the same address at the same cycle, yes. do, you get the, do you read the yeah. old data or new data? The, the uh, new data. New data, okay. yes. Sorry, yeah, I thought you were referring to caches. Hi, so there's a couple of groups that are doing um, open source FPGA generators. Do you know if they're considering using open RAM for like the block RAM and the LUT RAM so type stuff? That's a good question. I know some, I don't know that group in particular, but I know a group at Toronto that was using open RAM for an FPGA implementation for the block RAMs, yes. Okay, so the custom silicon and the process is behind it and the design rules will be shrouded in non-disclosures agreements mm -hmm. and secrets for who knows how long. So where do you draw the line between the open source, uh, har a hardware agnostic design and then the sp specific to a process node and full non-disclosures design? That's a very good question. Um, that's one of the main challenges with OpenRAM. Um, what we've been trying to do is provide these reference implementations which we can give out. And then the hope is that the, they're kind of predictive rules, that we're hoping that they're not that far from the real ones, and that's what we've been told. So that way you can have this thing we give you and then you can just tweak it a little bit to match your proprietary stuff. Actually, I liked your project and I was asking, can you get the rules from real layouts? So that's actually why I was kind of curious. Can we delaminate some chips and actually extract the rules so I can have them without signing an NDA? <laughs> so. That would be another option to do some for some various technologies. Um, I was wondering about, about uh, having used some of the commercial uh, RAM compilers. They have bizarre restrictions sometimes in the kinds of sizes of RAMs or the widths yeah. that you can put in and so on. Do you, do you have to have similar restrictions where, you know, like we've had caches that we have to split up the kind of read-write ports or something like that? That's, that's a great question. Ones? That's one of the frustrations I've had is you may get some memory compilers that are like, you can have these eight memories. And that's like basically it. Um, we're trying to do more tuning of our memories, especially with the timing, and that's why they usually fail and say, we, they, they say we've tried these memories, they work. Everything else probably won't work. We've taken the opposite approach where we'll try to make any memory and we'll let you know if it fails because we have regression testing and all that stuff. And so if we can add debug in there, then you can go in and be like, well, why isn't this memory working and tweak it? Or what we're doing now is we're actually doing some uh, automatic tuning of the timing to make things work. So kind of, um, yeah, making it, and that's also good because it makes it more robust to process variation and so on. So that, that's the approach we're taking. Because I've seen that from many architects have told me that same frustration, you know, that I can't get the memories I want, so. We're also thinking one more extended answer is uh, to provide another tool that's kind of a bigger thing, saying you want a large memory, what's the best way to break it down? And have kind of an estimator for OpenRAM to say, you know, you want to use 1K blocks or 2K blocks or, you know, for your power performance area trade-off. That's something we're going to add as well. It's a kind of a memory planner, essentially. I had a guy try to synthesize a 4 meg memory with OpenRAM a while ago, and I'm like, no, use 1K blocks or 4K blocks or something. He's like, oh. So that, that's why I was going to do that. What do you estimate is the engineering effort to take a specific uh, set of process rules, uh, you know, somebody who isn't necessarily part of the Open RAM project and wants to port it to their own process? That's a good question. I'm, I haven't done that yet. So we've done four technologies, uh, one proprietary, two of the Moses ones, and then this one. With every one, it gets a little bit easier. And so I'm not sure yet. The, the hardest part is making the couple, the couple cells you need by custom. So you have to basically set it up to do custom design for those couple cells. That's probably the biggest barrier. It also depends if, if it's a planar transistor technology. So basically before 28 nan bigger than 28 nanometer or after, we don't support anything less than 28 nanometer with FinFETs yet. Hmm. That's a big barrier. Um, we want to get support to do that, but most people that would support that already make their own memories. 
So. Embedded DRAM, that's another thing we could support as well, yeah. So I, I don't, that was kind of a hedge on that answer. I'm not sure. Uh, so many aspect of this uh, RAM design, uh, NG spies and DRC rules and so on, sounds familiar for anybody who did uh, custom layout, uh, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, especially for analog, uh, mm -hmm. or even high speed, self yeah. or anything. So, is there any chance to separate this this portion of a project as a baseline for anybody trying to do custom things? That's a good question. The framework is there to basically make anything. Like it, it abstracts basically general polygons, and it does measures anything you can measure in Spice. So we provide interfaces to that that could be reused. So you could technically do something that generates, you know, analog components, differential pairs, op amps. That could very well be done. One other question is uh, for multi-ported uh, <laughs> register files, how many ports you support? So register files, we only go up to two ports right now. We Register files themselves, I put that in the list of things we want to do because more than two ports, there's different types of um, memory uh, bit cells you use typically. And you typically don't use sense amps and it gets a little bit different. So we're going to split the register file stuff into its own kind of tool using the same backend. Uh, what about support for uh, design for the stability uh, logic like PPs? Then? That's a good question. So we're adding that. I have two students in my class right now that are adding BIST and ECC. Um, we're doing that with basically Verilog wrappers around it. And that stuff will be implemented in standard cells outside of the memory. And so that should be ready if they want to pass by June. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you expect this to expand to other types of things like flash or similar technologies? Yeah, so the embedded DRAM and then flash, um, I've tended to fo not focus on things that require sp like extra secret technologies. Bit DRAM bit cells are even more secretive than 6T bit cells. So in general, no. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I haven't really thought about going in that direction. So I'm a software engineer, and this is kind of highly yeah. new world to it's me. Almost analog. It's like and, and so black magic. One of the things I'm curious about is, you know, Rohammer is a significant incident for software engineers yeah. to have to deal with. Uh, is the, you know, if you state that you want a memory with more um, importance placed on resilience mm -hmm. uh, and correctness rather than, say, performance or efficiency, um, does that change the behavior of your tools? I, I'm, this is some of the stuff I'm looking at. I like to do research. Um, we're looking at Im security implications and stuff like that. So that's the type of thing I want to be able to look at. Right now, you can't because you don't know what the memories are. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. How like do you go to conferences and talk to guys who do this, you know, full time for TSMC and, and Global Foundries and stuff? How how open are they about what they actually do? Uh, not they're, they're willing to talk about what they do. But in terms of sharing what they do, like open source, no way. Yeah, right. um, that's why I'm kind of approaching it from the other end, where it's like, I don't have anything to lose, so why not do it? Yeah. It's hard to break into that. I'm hoping to basically get support from some smaller companies that are doing older technologies. And I mentioned I'm taping out a couple chips this fall. And the idea is they're older technologies that we already support, basically. And these companies pay a lot of money for memories right now. So there's a financial incentive for them to put a little memory on, try it, and be like, we talk about you know first silicon, second silicon, tenth silicon. We've had one tape out. We're going to have another two this fall. Then we're silicon proven. So um, you know when we get to ten, I guess. Yeah, cool. But um, I guess I'm just more curious about the bit cell itself. Like yeah. you say, you provide a few reference implementations, and then. Uh, do you make it you make it easy for us to design our own bit cell? Because obviously, like if we're using open RAM, I probably don't have a bit cell. <laughs> yeah. So you have to ha be set up to basically do layout. And you have to push the polygons by yourself to make a bit cell. Um, we provide the bit cells for those two technologies. If you make the technology config file right, we'll generate a bad bit cell. That does that other line mm -hmm. with our, what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's, that's really the bottleneck to the kind of time to get set up is that. Our hope is that if you're going to fab through you know, TSMC or something, you know, these older technologies, they can sometimes give you the bit cell, especially for the older technologies. Um, but that's you know, hit or miss, really. It depends on who the fab is and how old the technology is and so on. And then I had a second question. Uh, do you support synchronous and asynchronous memories, as well as how many ports can you go up to, is it? So right now, netlist only, we can go up to many ports, but in physical implementation, only two right now. Um, it's a synchronous interface right now. Uh, one of the students that worked on it's at Yale as a postdoc right now that I think just submitted a paper on asynchronous open RAM. Um, I haven't seen that yet, because she's extending it on her own. And she did a tape out with that, actually, as well. That's two weeks ago, I think. So. The asynchronous one was taped out there. So um, that's on my list, though, is I want to include that in the open source stuff. She's supposed to contribute back to it. We'll see. She wasn't one of the original authors, the original contributors, so I think she will. This is obviously a topic that many people are interested in. Uh, so we'll close with questions now, but I hope that everyone can come to OrConf, which is the Open RAM conference. Oops. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. <laughs> thank you.